Okay, in this lecture, we're going to do a quick EC2, other things to know, and then a summary for the exam. But overall, you know all there is to know already about EC2. All the stuff I'm giving to you is for you to be a great developer on AWS, which I think you want to be. And so you need to know about a few extra things. So first of all, the EC2 pricing. The EC2 pricing is per hour, the price are given per hour, and it varies on these parameters. The region you're in, the instance type you're using. So for example, we've been using T2 Micro so far and the on-demand versus spot versus reserve versus dedicated host. So we've been using on-demand so far. If you use Linux or Windows or another OS, we've been using Linux so far. So it depends on a bunch of stuff. And you are going to be billed by the second with a minimum of 60 seconds. So if you create an instance for like 30 seconds and then terminate it, you build for 60 seconds. But if you create an instance and wait 90 seconds before terminating it, then you will be billed for 90 seconds. Okay, you're also going to pay for other factors such as the storage, the data transfer, if you use a fixed IP, a public IP, load balancing, there's just a lot of things that go into EC2 pricing, okay? Overall, as you should know, you do not pay for the instance if the instance is stopped. So here's a quick example. We have a T2 small in US East 1 and it costs 0.023 per hour. If you use it for six seconds, it's a minimum of 60 seconds. If you use it for 60 seconds, then you pay these actual 60 seconds. And if you use them for half an hour, you pay for that half hour. And for one month, you can do a quick math and see that it costs you $16.56, okay? Assuming that a month is 30 days. And so basically that just shows that uh, you can rent a server online on the cloud for $16. That's a good number to have in mind. Now, whatever the formula you want, if it's X number of seconds, you just use that formula. Pretty simple. Now, the best way to know the pricing is to, cons to consult the pricing page. And here it is. I, uh, the pricing changes all the time on Amazon. They have a tendency to reduce price over time. So things may be irrelevant tomorrow for all I know. So just go online and make sure you get familiar with the pricing of EC2. So far, we should have been using the free tier, except these elastic IPs, which may have cost a little bit of money if they were unused. Now, you can also use AMI for uh, EC2. And the AMI we've been using so far was the Amazon Linux. So as we can see, when we create a launch instance, you know, the... the the menu we get Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, Windows, etc., 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 and we've been using Amazon Linux. And also, we can customize these images at runtime using the EC2 user data. We've seen this, right? But if we always do the same thing, if we always do the same EC2 user data, what if we could just create our own images ready to go? And you can do this, and it's called a custom AMI. So it's an image used to create our instance. And you can build custom AMIs for Linux or Windows machine. So why would you even use a custom AMI? Well, there's a couple use cases. You may want to pre-install some packages. You want a faster boot time, so you don't need to have a super long EC2 user data script at boot time. You may want to have the machine that comes configured with monitoring or enterprise software, uh, some security concerns. You only want to allow people on the machine, on the network, you know, to have some control over it, over who can SSH into these machines. Maybe you want to control the maintenance and updates of these machines over time. Maybe you want active directory integration, so you have to install it once and then everyone can have it. Or you want to install your application ahead of time for faster deploys. Or you want to use someone else's AMI for that is optimized for whatever you want to do, running an application or a DB. I mean, basically, you can do anything you can think of with AMIs, okay? There are so many use cases, and I think it's quite common for people in big companies to maintain their own set of AMIs. Now, something you should know is that when you build an AMI, it is built for a specific AWS region. And that's super important to know. When you build an AMI, it's not globally available. It is only available for a specific AWS region. Now, for our EC2 instances, I told you there were types, but I never really defined what the types are. So basically, when you go to the AWS website, there's five distinct characteristics that your instance are going to have. They're going to have a type of RAM, like an amount of generation. There's going to be CPU, so the number of uh, cores, the type, the meg, the frequency, the generation. You're going to have the I.O., such as the disk performance, if there's EBS optimizations, the network, such as how fast it's going to be, low, medium, high, the latency, and then if it's going to have any GPU on it. Now, as you can see, that is a lot of different distinct characteristics for your instances. And so it's daunting to choose the right one. There's over 50 different instance types on EC2 and growing as we speak over the years. 
So there is a website called ec2instances.info that can help us summarizing this type of instances. But basically, we have R, C, P, G, H, X, I, F, Z, and C, R, which are specialized in RAM, CPU, IO, network, and GPU. So each of these instances will have a small characteristic, something better. For example, the R instances come with a lot of RAM, and the C instances come with a lot of CPU, and so on. So overall for the exam, do not worry, they do not ask questions about which instance is the best for whatever RAM and CPU, but as you start using AWS, you will get familiar with which instance gives you what, okay? Then we have the M instances, and the M are balanced. They're basically good at everything, but not great at everything. So M instances have good RAM, good CPU, good I.O., good network, and no GPUs. And then we have T2 and recently T3, and they're burstable instance types. And so the most common T2 you're going to use is T2 Micro because it's free, and that's the one we've been using so far. So T2 and T3 are burstable instances. What does that even mean? Well, burstable instances is basically a concept that overall the instance is okay CPU performance, and then when it needs to process something very unexpected, it can burst. That means that there's a spike in load in your application, your CPU burst, and CPU can be very, very good. And I'm serious when I say very good, right? And when the machine bursts, it will utilize something called burst credits. And when all the credits are gone, the CPU becomes bad, and I may say horrible. So basically, if the machine stops bursting, then the credits are accumulated back over time. So the burst is here to help you handle a sudden unexpected load and still get very good CPU. But then if the load is too long, then your CPU becomes really, really bad. So how does it look like? Basically, you get uh, an instance and if you run constantly low on credits, you need to move to a non-burstable kind of instance because otherwise your performance is going to be really, really bad. So if we look at um, some monitoring, and we'll do this later on, but it's called CloudWatch, we can see that basically on the graph right here, the instance used a lot of CPU credit usage because it was bursting and it was doing a lot of CPU actions. And we can see that the CPU credit balance went straight down all the way to 300, and then I stopped doing my load. And then as I stopped doing my load, the CPU credit balance went slowly back up to this level. And so basically what this shows is that basically my instance was able to get extra CPU power, but then if the credit balance went all the way down, then I would have lost my CPU capacity and my instance would have been pretty much useless, okay? So you need to know about this about T2 instances because if you don't know about it and you use T2 instances too instantly, intensely, then your application will get crappy performance at some point. Now CPU credits, basically there's a whole table you can find in the documentation about how fast you earn CPU credits based on the kind of instance. I won't linger on this too much, but just know that there is a table somewhere which tells you how fast they're accumulated. Now there's this new concept called T2 Unlimited, and T2 Unlimited is basically possible to have unlimited burst credit balance. You pay extra money if you go over your credit balance, but you don't lose in performance. And overall, it's a new offering. Be careful, costs will go really, really high if you're not monitoring your instances and they just consistently clock in at 100% CPU usage. You can read about it on the blog. So now just a quick checklist because we have an exam to pass and you may say, wow, that's a lot of information. What do I really need to know for the exam? Well, the basics really. You need to know how to SSH into EC2 and change the PEM file permissions if you get an error. You need to know how to properly use security groups. That's super important. So opening the right ports, locking down security to the right IPs or the right security groups, and so on. You need to know the fundamental difference between private, public, and elastic IP. You need to know how to use user data, how it allows you to customize basically your instance at boot time, and you need to know that you can build custom AMIs to enhance your operating system, okay? EC2 instances are built by the second, and they can be easily created and thrown away. Welcome to the cloud. This is the most important concept. You can spin up virtual machines and get rid of them in no time for a very little amount of money. And that's the basic of AWS. Now we're going to build on this concept and see how the rest of Amazon Cloud can help you become a much better developer.